So uh, first of all, of course, thank you very much for the invitation and for organizing this uh, very nice workshop. So today I would like to talk about some recent work that my collaborators and I did concerning the dynamics of quantum many body systems that are weakly interacting. So they can be integrable or not, but will be weakly interacting. And basically uh, our main result is to establish a connection between two different descriptions that you ha can have of these models. And here are these uh, acronyms that I put in the title. So generalized hydrodynamics and this uh, BBK, uh, BBGKY hierarchy. So these are two uh, different descriptions uh, that one can employ for weakly interacting systems. And we managed to establish a connection between the two. Uh, don't worry if you don't know about these uh, two acronyms, I will try to, to explain what they are in, in the talk. Okay, so let me start with a brief outline of what I'm talking about. So uh, the first part of the, of the talk will um, involve uh, basically a summary of what has been understood concerning the dynamics of quantum matters that is uh, out of equilibrium. And there I will briefly introduce this generalized hydrodynamics, which is the formalism that is uh, able to describe the late time dynamics of integrable systems. So in the second part of the talk, instead, I will focus on weakly interacting fermionic quantum gases, which is the main uh, setting that we uh, want to consider. And I will review very briefly what is uh, BBGKY hierarchy is. And finally, I will present our results on uh, basically matching the two descriptions and understanding what integrability is uh, in, this, uh, in this setting that I'm interested in, so which is weakly interacting fermionic quantum gases. Okay, so let me uh, get started uh, with, the, with the first part. So quantum matter out of equilibrium. So essentially the question that we want to ask is, uh, can we describe interacting quantum many particle systems that are driven out of equilibrium? Okay, so typically the setting that we consider when we want to study this question is uh, the so-called quantum quench setting. So the setting is very simple. We prepare a quantum many body system in some initial state, which can be thought of as, for example, the ground state of some well-behaved local Hamiltonian. And then we evolve this state with a Hamiltonian for which the state is not an eigenstate. Actually, uh, the interest in physics happens when the eigenstate is a superposition of uh, macroscopically many, of exponentially many in the volume eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And a very simple way to do that is, uh, well, we prepare the, the system in the ground state of some Hamiltonian, and then we change some external parameter of the Hamiltonian. For example, I don't know, a magnetic field or a coupling or something like that. So in this way, we'll typically produce the interesting situation. And uh, the advantages of this setting uh, are basically threefold. So the first one is that this setting is very simple and well-defined. So essentially we can actually do calculations. We can compute things analytically, but also numerically, we can put things in computers and compute. The second important point is that uh, this setting is experimentally relevant. Essentially, uh, this uh, is something that happened over the, over the last uh, two decades. Well, with advances, advances in the experimental techniques in the field of uh, um, cold atoms, essentially, so cold atoms trapped in uh, optical lattices, one can actually realize this uh, very simple setting in actual experiments. So the, this picture I'm putting here is probably the most famous experiment in, in the field, the so-called quantum Newton cradle. And if you saw a talk on uh, some related subjects, you probably saw already this picture. <clears throat> So the third point is that um, this simple setting is uh, simple, but is uh, good enough to display the key physics, okay? So it, it can actually um, reveal or can uh, uh, allow us to understand what are the, the main physical pro processes that are governing <coughs> uh, the, 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 the system in, sec in, in question. So what are the main questions that one <coughs> can ask in this setting? Well, uh, basically, we can divide them in uh, three main groups. So the first is uh, very simple. So I recall that here uh, we are studying systems that are evolving purely unitarily. So the Hamiltonian here is uh, 
that has no other effect than pure unitary evolution. There is no dissipation of any sort. And so the first question that one might ask is, uh, is this kind of evolution leading to some sort of stationarity? And if so, how? Uh, since the evolution is unitary, of course, probabilities are concerned. So it might seem a very non-trivial statement that there is any sort of relaxation in the set. And a very direct uh, second question is then, if there is some sort of relaxation, can we describe the stationary state? Can we find an efficient way to uh, basically find what the stationary state will be without solving the, the full dynamics? That of course will be very complicated. Well, and the third question of course is uh, what about the finite time dynamics? So are there some universal laws? Uh, is there some emergent law that is uh, governing the dynamics of a quantum manual system? And if so, uh, can we understand them? <clears throat> okay. So essentially, uh, these uh, three questions have been studied uh, a lot over the last uh, two decades now. Uh, well, also before, but more extensively over the last two decades. And um, at the moment, uh, the situation is the following. So there is a reasonably good understanding of the first two questions. While the third one is, I mean, we understood something, but I would say that is uh, very much still open. So let me uh, briefly review what we understand about the first two. So um, let me start considering the simplest possible setting. So let me consider the case where both the initial state and the time evolving Hamiltonian are invariant under translations. Okay, so a purely homogeneous setting. So how can relaxation happen in such a, in such a situation? Well, relaxation can happen locally in space. What do I mean by that? Well, if I focus on a small subsystem, A here, and I consider the limit in which the rest of the system becomes infinitely large, so I take the thermodynamic limit, but I focus only on a finite subsystem, that one, then what can happen is that the rest of the system basically will act as some sort of bath for my local subsystem. So information can flow out of my subsystem and never come back because the rest of the system is infinitely large. And therefore, in this setting, I can actually observe some sort of relaxation. So uh, if we want to write it more uh, in, in more mathematical terms, then we have something like that. So if we consider the reduced density matrix of a given subsystem A with respect to the rest, then we take the thermodynamic limit. So we send the rest of the system to infinity and then we take the infinite time limit, then this typically exists. Note that this means that basically the expectation value of any local observable will relax. Okay, so now we understood that uh, at least uh, it is feasible that even under unitary dynamics, there, there can be some sort of relaxation. So let's uh, go to the next question and ask, uh, can we describe these uh, rho s, these stationary states? Well, of course, uh, everyone will uh, agree with me that it is obvious that this stationary state will in some way be described by uh, conserved quantities of, of, the, of the system. And therefore, one might immediately guess that the stationary state can be written in, in the following form. So like uh, as a Gibbs state where these uh, betas here are uh, generalized temperatures, if you want, and these QMs are conserved charges. But the question is, uh, what conserved charges should I include in this state? Because uh, any given quantum system, which is, can be integrable or not, will have a number of conserved charges that, it at that is at least proportional to the size of its Hilbert space, because I can uh, consider as conserved charges all the projectors on the Hamiltonian eigenstates. So are they all important? Are they all going to matter? Well, the answer is no. The only conservation laws that I have to include here in order to describe the values of um, the stationary values of local observables are the so-called local conservation laws or more technically quasi-local. So what, what are those? Well, these are um, operators that can be written as sums over space or, uh, or an integral of some local density, meaning that this density will be uh, basically non-trivial only around one point with at most exponentially decaying phase. Okay, so these are the actually the only uh, conservation laws that matter to describe the stationary state of 
of, of uh, the stationary value of, of a given local observer. And another important point is that uh, these inverts, uh, sorry, these um, generalized temperatures are not arbitrary. They are fixed by essentially the conservation of the conservation laws. What do I mean by that? Well, since the conservation laws are conserved, their densities are fulfilling a set of continuity equations. And since now we are in a homogeneous setting, what that means is that the expectation value of a given density, so if I take this equation here and I take the expectation value on the initial state, then what I will have is that the space derivative will, will vanish because everything is transitional invariant. And therefore I will have that the, uh, uh, well, time derivative of the expectation value of the density it will be conserved in time. And so uh, I, I have a, a constraint on my stationary state. I have that the expectation value of, the, of any given density of conserved charge has to be the same in the initial state and in the stationary state. So in this way, I can fix all, all the betas. Okay. So, but what happens in a more general setting where I, I, I can not have a uh, full translational environments? Well, essentially what happens is that um, if variations are slow enough, everything is uh, still going through. So the difference is that now my stationary state will acquire some sort of uh, slow dependence on position and time. So it will not be exactly stationary, will be quasi stationary. And uh, the dependence on position and time will be encoded in these uh, the temperatures. And once again, the temperatures will be fixed by taking the expectation value of the continuity equation for all the charges, right? So here I'm denoting the, um, the, the objects without the hat are the expectation values here. So essentially, uh, if I take the expectation value of the operatorial continuity equation, I get these, that is a scalar continuity equation that depends only on uh, these temperatures, okay? So this is a set of equations that if I manage to solve, will fix completely the dependence of uh, beta on X and T. And therefore, then I can put the betas back in, the, in my stationary state and I will find the expectation value of any local observable at, at dark times. So uh, to treat these uh, system of equations is uh, useful to, to make a simple change of variables. So, Instead of using uh, the, the, the inverse temperatures, I will use uh, the uh, density of charges, right? So I can do that. And now I can just rewrite my equation again. And now I, I have this set of equations that if I manage to solve, once again, will uh, determine the expectation value of any given local observable, at least at large enough times. And we see that uh, this equation is as follows. So I have the time derivative of my density of concert charge. And then I have this uh, object here. Uh, so I have the uh, space derivative, so the derivative with respect to x of this uh, j, that is a function of all the, the densities. So this is basically an equation of state, is model dependent and tells me how currents uh, depend on the expectation value of charges. And this is nothing but a set of hydrodynamic equations. And their form will, will depend precisely on uh, the symmetries of the model and the number of conservation laws. For example, this, the simple possible example is when I have a system that has only uh, three conserved charges. So uh, energy, number of particle, momentum, and then has Galilean invariants. So if in, for this system, if I write down these equations, I will just find this, the standard equations for conventional hydrodynamics. Okay. Um, but, uh, well, uh, there are more interesting cases. For example, um, an interesting case is the following, is the one of the so-called integrable models, where I have a set of charge densities that now is uh, a very large number. It, it, it involves a number of charge densities that is proportional to the volume of the system. Okay, so th these systems are not only interesting because they have many conservation laws, they are interesting in general, uh, especially in one dimension because uh, typically are solvable in some sense, but also strongly interacting. So here I'm listing two, uh, the, the two probably more uh, most famous examples of, uh, of uh, integrable models in 1D. So there is the XXZ uh, spin half chain, which is basically the standard model of uh, magnetism in, uh, in one dimension. 
and uh, Fermi Hubbard model, which is the, the simplest possible model of, uh, of a solid in, in one dimension. So <clears throat> essentially the presence of these uh, very large number of local conservation laws implies that uh, these systems have stable quasi-particle excitations at every energy density. Okay, so then, okay, so what happens if I want to write the hydrodynamics for these systems? Well, since um, I took as a first thing the thermodynamic limit, then I, I need to uh, basically work with a set of equations that involves uh, infinitely many of them, okay? So how can I treat them? Well, uh, the idea to treat them is to make a further change of variables. So it is uh, useful to change variables from the set of charge densities to this row of k, x, and t. What is that? Basically, this one is uh, counting the density of quasi-particles with a given momentum k at position x, okay? So instead of looking at these uh, conserved charges, I look at basically a different set of conserved charges. Uh, I, I look at the uh, distribution of quasi-particles. And why is that useful? Well, because the um, uh, continuity equation for these uh, density of quasi-particles will be uh, very simple. So uh, to, 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 to make an example, let me show this movie. So let me show a very a simple example of uh, integrable model that in this case is classical. It's just a, a one dimensional classical hardball. So what happens if I set uh, this thing in motion? Well, we see that essentially what happens is that the set of velocities that I have at the beginning is conserved by the dynamics. Now here it gets actually reflected because I put uh, uh, hard walls on the two sides. But so essentially these, the, the set of velocities will uh, describe my quasi-particles. So let, let me just uh, show a, a snapshot of the evolution of the system here. So uh, on this direction, on the horizontal direction, I have space and on the vertical direction going down, I have time. So these uh, white uh, stripes here are the, are the, are the hard spheres. So what happens is that if I set this, this system into motion, the spheres will, will uh, scatter among each other. But what will happen is that I can follow the uh, trajectory of the particle that uh, of um, a certain velocity, okay? So of the initial velocity, for example, that uh, it was uh, at the beginning of this particle here. And then it moves in this way. So, um, so essentially, if we look at it from far enough, it really looks like this uh, velocity is following some sort of uh, uh, free motion, but it's not moving with its initial velocity. So what I mean is, so the particle at the beginning had this free velocity and if uh, there were no interactions, it would just go uh, in this way like that. But since there are interactions, it actually moves slower and it moves like that. Actually here, it, it, it moves faster <laughs> the thing I, uh, for, for the, for the kind of interaction I put. So it follows a different um, trajectory. It's still uh, ballistic, but with, with, with a different velocity. Well, but this velocity can be computed very, very easily, um, essentially by, by uh, knowing precisely what the scattering does, what the two particle, particle scattering does. So essentially we can write it down. So one can write that the, uh, the, velo the effective velocity or the dress velocity of the quasi-particle that had, uh, well, momentum K, which uh, is a way to label the, 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 the initial velocity if you want, is uh, fulfilling this uh, integral equation, which you see depends on the velocity itself. So it, it gets some uh, non-trivial dressing where this big K here is, uh, is a function that describes uh, essentially the scattering, okay? But once I know this velocity, then the current of these quasi-particles is, is extremely simple because it's just the one of free particles. So it's just the, the dress velocity or the effective velocity times the density, okay? But then- Sorry, can I, I ask a question about this? Please, go ahead. Um, I didn't quite understand these conserved quantities. So you had, you had your example of the-, the... Yes. The, um, the balls colliding. Oh, oh, 
Yes. So the thing that's conserved is, um, yeah, so again, the that's set of velocities. So it's basically what you can, what, what this uh, um, red trajectory here is, is the tracer of a given velocity. Oh, I see. It's not the case that, that the velocity of each individual particle remains no. invariant. It doesn't, but there's always some particle moving with some- Exactly. There, there will always velocity. be, in, in, in the simple movie before, there was always a particle that was moving with, with that initial velocity. It was not the same as the, as the initial one. So the particle is changing, but that velocity is always present there, right? And, and what is rho? Sorry? What is rho? Rho is the, essentially the density of quasi-particles with a given initial velocity. And how to, and how to, to get this rho? How to, yeah, well, that is a, that's a very good question. Uh, basically, this is the, the topic of the talk, essentially. Um, but yeah, okay. so, yes. Uh, One more question. If, um, if we were to regulate, if we were to take your integral models and regulate them so that they only have a finite number of degrees of freedom, is that an okay thing to do? So, uh, and regulate them, well, you, 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 Essentially, this is what you do typically, right? So you put them in a finite volume and then so, so that you have finite densities and then you take the thermodynamic limit at the end. And this is exactly what, what is done here. But, but it's still integrable when you, when you make it finite. It is still integrable, yes. I see. And then just to recap the statement is you, you start with- um, Essentially start because with there, like are, uh, there are integrable lattice models, sorry. Uh, the statement is that there are integrable lattice models, if you like, right? So those that I was showing before are two famous examples, but of course there are very many. I see, but we start with like five particles with the following five velocities, and then at each particle at a later time has those same five velocities, it just permutes which particles have those five yes. velocities. So of course, this is okay. a, a toy example. This is a very simple toy example, uh, just, just to show what happens in, in, a, in a simple classical case. But yeah, it gives the idea, essentially. These, uh, Why do you talk about the effective velocity then? I'm sorry? What's your effective velocity then? Because it sounds like we know the velocities. So the effective velocity describes how this velocity tracer moves. So once again, if you look at the picture, right? So you see that. Um, if the particle with some initial velocity at here at the beginning was just moving with that velocity forever, then you would see this, uh, sorry, uh, this um, yellow line. Sorry, we, we, we maybe started. But instead, because uh, this uh, tracer of a given velocity is uh, scattered around every time that there is a scattering, actually you are moving with a different velocity. So the tracer of velocity v1 will not move at velocity v1, will move at this, uh, at this effective velocity that depends on the density of, of, of all the other uh, particles, essentially. Right? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't stop for questions and uh, I'm very sorry about that, but please ask if you have, have any other question or, or so far. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had a little question. Uh, when you define the, the local GGE, yes. so this is just the thermalization part, um, I was wondering, is anything known about how those generalized temperatures, beta n, actually have to decay with n in a thermal state? Because if they were all order one, I mean, presumably the state wouldn't be defined. That's, uh, that, that's a very good question. So yes, um, so essentially what, what happens, um, in practice, when you want to construct that state, is that the most, uh, so the more a certain charge is local and the more it will count in that, in that, um, in that uh, stationary state. So essentially the beta will be large. The more the charge is no local, uh, the more this beta will, will decay quick, essentially. Uh, I see, and is, is there so, a precise- So basically, in other words, if you want to describe an observable that is very local in space, you only need the very few uh, local uh, conserved charges. If you want to go uh, further and describe more and more, you need to add more charges um, uh, in order to, to have a precise description. I don't know if I... Well, I, I was wondering if there are estimates actually on how the, the beta scales with N. Uh, 
that maybe yes. that's so yeah I, I think there are actually there are a few papers that studied that no, we, we can discuss later now I, okay, sure. I, I can give you the references uh Thanks. but yeah no i don't remember uh, what is the skating though I, I, I perhaps is known uh, i don't want to say that it's not known but i i i can't uh, come up with it at uh, at the moment but we can discuss but thank later. you no worries other questions on this all right so once again the point i want to make with this slide is that um, if i look at this in, in this simple example of of the of the hard field if i look at the motion of the tracers of each given initial velocity these will move ballistically right with some velocities that we can compute but these, these velocities will not be trivial will depend on the density of particles right but i can find them i can compute them and once i compute them i know exactly what the current is and this is what these two formulas are trying to are trying to explain. So I have to compute this effective velocity in some way, but then when I know it, the current is just uh, v times the density of particle, right? They just move as free particles. So the, this would be the current of a of a of a free particle moving at velocity uh, v of of a gas of free particles that are moving at velocity, right? Okay. So but then. Um, Perfect. So now we, we just have to plug this J into this equation. And what we get is, sorry. Yeah. And what we get is this equation here that basically describes the evolution of this density of quasi particles. So the, these, these equation here, or if you want uh, this set of equations, if you want to think about them as uh, different equations, one, one for each K, uh, form the so called generalized hydrodynamics. Why generalize? Essentially, because uh, it's the hydrodynamics of a system that has uh, infinitely many local conservation laws. Okay, so uh, the talk will 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 not be about this, but let me just briefly uh, mention that this description that seems very uh, theoretical and very far from from reality actually is describing extremely well some uh, cold atomic exp experiments. Now. Okay, so this was the only thing I wanted to mention. All right, instead, what the talk will be about is I want to understand better what this rho is, as uh, Alexia was asking before. So essentially, I want to understand better this mapping. So can we understand this mapping microscopically? microscopically? So the, the mapping between the uh, conservation laws, essentially, and this uh, density of quasi particles. So essentially, what I would like to do is to express the density of quasi particles in terms of the operators of the theory. And in doing that, I will also try to understand what fails when integrability is broken, when there is no integrability. What, what happens? Why, why can't I do this? Why, why can't I have this mapping? So essentially, this is uh, well, what we studied in, uh, in this recent paper together with Fabian Estler from uh, Oxford and uh, Etienne Granet, who is now in uh, Chicago. OK. So. Um, all right, this is uh, the, the end of the, the first introductory part of the talk. So once again, if you have any question on what I just said, uh, that would be a great moment to ask them. Otherwise, I will move on. Good, OK. Um, you had one? No. I, right. I, I did have one, but I think I'll just wait for you to describe. OK, OK, thanks. Right, so let me now move to the to the second point I wanted to cover. So these uh, Winkley interacting fermionic quantum gases is one B. So essentially, this is the setting that we want to consider. So it, it, essentially, what we what we consider is uh, systems described by Hamiltonians of this form. So where we have a simple kinetic term. So these are these psi's are fermionic operators. We have a simple kinetic term, and then we put a two particle uh, scattering term described by this potential B, right? And then we want to study the case in which uh, B, uh, so which basically sets the, the, the size of the, of the, of the interaction, uh, will be small. And OK, we, we, can, uh, we put it in a finite volume to, in order to treat finite densities. And we uh, consider periodic boundary conditions. So one can think of the system as this uh, nice reading with, with the fermions uh, being the red bolts. So why is this uh, setting? Uh, interesting for our study? Well, first of all, it's because it contains integrable points. So for some specific values of this uh, V here, 
uh, I will get integrable models. For example, um, I can con co consider uh, Calogero Sutherland like integrable models if I take this V equal to uh, the virus trust elliptive function. Uh, to, to more precisely, so the virus trust elliptive function depends on two parameters. And here I have to set one of the two parameters equal to the size of the system in order to have this nice uh, periodic check. So, but I will still have the dependence on, on the other parameter, which is instead of A. So some examples that I can consider is the potential one over X squared. Well, actually one over sine squared of, uh, of this quantity here. And then instead sinh potential, these are all uh, examples of integrable models. One over sinh squared potential, sorry. So another um, integrable instance of this uh, theory here is the so-called Cheon Shigehara uh, uh, model, which is essentially the fermionic form formulation of the Liebelinger model, so of the one-dimensional uh, Bose gas with uh, delta function interactions. So essentially, since we are in 1D, we can map easily fermions into bosons. So we can also have a fermionic description of that. Uh, importantly, the fermions in the, in the, in the fermionic uh, formulation of Liebelinger are weakly coupled when the bosons are strongly coupled. Another interesting thing to uh, note is that uh, the second quantized potential for, for these fermions have, have been found actually very recently in this uh, paper, um, uh, still by the same group of authors. Um, so essentially here, we, we basically propose the form for the, for the regularized uh, potential that, uh, that describes the, the Cheon Shigehara interaction. And indeed is weak when uh, the, the uh, the bosons are strongly coupled. Okay, so but my point here was just to make that uh, was just to say that contains so this this uh, setting here contains integrable points, right? The second uh, point that I want to make is that um, these integrable models here have no bound states. So what that what that means is that basically these uh, quasi particles, these conserved uh, quasi particles these stable quasi-particles are smoothly connected to free fermions for these uh, specific systems. So what, what, what that means is that uh, basically if I, uh, so here I'm, I'm plotting the spectral function. So if I increase beta from, from zero where, where this would just be a well-defined line, then this line is broadening, but nothing uh, weird happens. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, the, the stable quasi-particle will have, uh, let's say, a, a finite overlap with, with the fermions. And essentially, this means that um, we don't expect any abrupt change when we increase the interaction, right? So essentially, this is a case where we expect we can make some progress um, by just employing simple perturbation here. This statement is, doesn't the statement depend on the form of V? It is, uh, um, I mean, is your statement that for any potential you have no bound state? No, no, so, so yeah, yeah no, no, it's a good point. So this statement that I'm talking about here is referring to these integrable models. Ah, so uh -huh, to okay. the integrable points. So yes, of course, it, it depends definitely on the, on the form of V. Um, what I'm saying is that these integrable models in particular have this special property. So in general, in, in integrable models, you will have some stable quasi-particles that can be taught as bound states of some elementary stable quasi-particles, right? So in this case, this doesn't happen. That's what I'm trying to say. So, and, and, and this is just the simplifying the description if you want. Are these the only integrable uh, potentials that are known? I mean, I, 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 I mean, the Weierstrass example is well known, and the and the um, hardcore potential is well known. But are there others? I mean, or has anyone investigated that question? Well, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, no, there are no other known. Um, at least, at least once again, uh, with uh, without these uh, further bound states. Okay, so so there are none, so, but but. Probably at least none are known that have any bound states. Exactly. Yeah. But so what I will what I will try to convince you um, uh, what, what I will try to discuss later is that if we assume that there are no bound states, then these uh, 
will, are the only the only possible integral potentials in this set. But uh, okay, so let's uh, get there uh, slowly. I had another question because I mean I, I remember uh, I mean I've looked a little bit at the at the case of the Calogero Sutherland the generalized Calogero Sutherland models, yes. and um, you can look at them in an infinite volume. Uh, the virus stress function doesn't have to have a period that is equal to the volume. It can be any um, um, any integral factor. Of yeah, yeah, it, it can. Yeah, so, so that's also an, an important point. So yes, but this is a restriction I'm making. Yes, I want to make them well defined and with this periodicity in finite volume. So in general, this is not necessary. You, you can you can do you can do more. Essentially, what you can do is. It will be integral, integrable also if you put any value instead of L here, right? Will still be integrable. But this will not be considered in this setting, essentially. Uh, and I'm, I'm restricting myself so to this specific case. So here, I, I will not consider the case in which this, this one is, again, another arbitrary parameter, if you like. And uh, yeah. But I mean, you could make um, you could make the volume equal to uh, you could make that parameter uh, half of L, for example, or a third of L. Yes, in, in principle, I can. Yes, in principle, but but yeah, I will I will have um, essentially this would mean that uh, I don't know I, I will have a divergence in, in the middle of my chain or something that will be potential, right? So I I don't want that. Right, I I, I want the the potential to to be. I want my particles to be able to just span the full line with no divergence in the potential, essentially. Does does that? Uh... Yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, great. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so these are, okay, so these two points here are essentially why we consider this setting as some sort of minimal setting for 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 our um, for our study. Okay, so in this particular setting, uh, a way to describe the system is uh, the the this hierarchy I was talking about in the title. So what is it? Well, basically, what one does is uh, well we, we take our system. And the standard way to describe it is to use these n particle density matrices, which is nothing but the expectation value of uh, monomials, if you want, in the fermionic operators. And then what one can do is writing the uh, evolution equations for these for these objects. One way to do that is uh, to write the Heisenberg equations for these monomials and then take the expectation value. And what one ends up with doing that is uh, this set of equations. That you see are coupling the equation for rho n with the equation for rho n plus one. So I'm creating some sort of uh, infinite hierarchy of equations. So in order to describe the full system, I need to solve the equation for rho one, then for rho two, and so on. That are all coupled together. I can't just uh, um, well. Uh, I, I need to describe the full hierarchy of that. And this is indeed the the BBGKY hierarchy that is uh, named after this. Uh, uh, five gentlemen here. Uh, the same kind of um, uh, hierarchy can be written, of course, for uh, let's say different representations of the same n particle density matrices. What I mean by that is that one can write uh, well a momentum space representation of of these rows just by taking the Fourier transform, or a Wigner representation taking some sort of hybrid uh, Fourier transform where we transform only. Uh, 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 the the um, relative coordinate, but we we leave the center of mass coordinate um, uh, still in in real space. Okay. Okay, I'm a little confused now. Rho of t is just an arbitrary function of time, or is it? Is it uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, no, I'm using too many rows, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. So rho of t here is is the state, is the, the reduced density matrix or the density matrix of, of the time evolving state in this equation, only in this equation, uh, right? Well, this other rho here is, uh, well, some, some scalar function that is just the expectation value, the time evolving expectation value of this monomial uh, on the, um, made out of the uh, fermionic operators. Uh, does it make sense? Yeah, sure. Okay. So yeah, so okay. 
Um, so this row T here is actually the state, is, is, the, is the density matrix of, of, of the system. OK, so good. Now, for, for general beta, this infinite hierarchy of equation is not very uh, practical, of course, because one would, as I said, need to solve all of them. And we typically cannot do that. But for small beta, it is useful because it can be truncated, essentially. So the simplest possible way to truncate this hierarchy leads to the so-called uh, quantum Boltzmann equation. So the idea is, is actually uh, very simple. So essentially what one does is it takes the four particle uh, density matrix and drops the connected part of it. So basically writes them only in terms of the two particle reduced density matrix, basically applying the Vick's theorem, even if the Vick's theorem doesn't hold. Right, so one uh, uh, gets some disconnected parts of uh, of of Gibb, uh, of uh, Vick's form, and then drops the rest. Okay, and then defines this function f through the following scaling limit. So we take the limit of uh, the interaction strength going to zero, and and we we consider the, the following the, the following um, um, limit of row two. Okay. So here we are basically rescaling time to, to go basically to infinity in such a way that t over b squared is, a fi is fixed. OK, so in this limit, the hierarchy can be rewritten in terms of, uh, of, uh, of an equation for, for this f that takes the following form. So you see this looks like uh, the Boltzmann transport equation. So here there is the. Uh, let's say free roaming part of the Boltzmann equation. While on this side, there is essentially a collisional derivative part. So uh, you see here, I'm, uh, there is a scattering term essentially where I am conserving momentum. This is uh, this delta of conservation of momentum. I'm conserving energy. And then there is some amplitude or, uh, for, for the scattering. And this one here is uh, taking into account the fermionic statistics. So the, essentially this part here is the only part that distinguishes this uh, quantum Boltzmann equation from the standard uh, Boltzmann transport equation that has, one has for classical systems. So, OK, but um, I wrote this one down just because now if we go back and recall the equation I wrote before, this GHD equation that I wrote before, uh, well, we have the following. So the GHD equation that I wrote before looks very much like the free roaming part of this one. So you see both this f and this rho are essentially describing some sort of um, momentum distribution of, of quasi-particles. But you see that here, this one doesn't have a, a collisional derivative term, right? So is it, it is in some sense non-collisional. And the, the, the question is, well, how, how can this happen? So how can we relate these two descriptions? How can we match the two? Well, this is uh, an, a question that I want to, to, to consider in this talk. Uh, so any, any, any question about, uh, about uh, what I said so far? No, okay, good. So fine. So we can now finally uh, go uh, to, the, to, the actual, to the actual results. So the, the, the point is that I want to match these two descriptions. And in, in the meanwhile, I will also try to understand something about the uh, integrability of the systems. So essentially, the strategy will be to first construct charges of the Hamiltonian in perturbation theory. And second, use these charges that I construct explicitly in terms of the fermionic operators to build some sort of operatorial uh, density of quasi-particles, operatorial uh, row of k, x, and t using the charges. So let's, let's do the first step. So the first step is actually very simple. So I define some charge as the, the sum from m that goes uh, from 0 to infinity, of m that goes from 0 to infinity, and these qm are of order m in beta, OK? In particular, the Hamiltonian can be written as some h0, that was over to 0, and h1, of course. And then I apply the following strategy. So I build charges recursively in momentum space using this, this equation. That is just uh, 
the expression in perturbation theory of the conservation of the charge. So this is just uh, rewriting H commutator with Q equals zero. If I write it at order M in perturbation theory, that's what I get, right? And then um, I investigate the locality properties of what, I, of what I construct, because as we said before, integrability is related to the fact that there are uh, very many of these charges, but these charges are local in space in, in some sense. Okay, and my starting point, uh, I will start from uh, charges of the free system. And charges of the free system can be constructed very simply in, in momentum space, and they just uh, look uh, like that. So they are sums over some momentum of some function, some arbitrary function f, and then I have the psi dagger p, psi p. So basically, I'm counting, uh, essentially, I'm weighing with some function the occupation of each uh, given mode momentum mode. OK, so before starting, let me make uh, two observations. The first observation is that, so if I take these charges here and I rewrite them in real space, so I just take a Fourier transform, then I will get something that is quasi-local in space. Why? Well, because this uh, charge Q that I wrote can be uh, seen as the integral in dx of something that is the integral in dy of f of psi dagger psi. But this f here, this f tilde, sorry, is the Fourier transform of my initial f, decays very fast in space, decays typically exponentially fast in space because it's the Fourier transform of a smooth function, okay? So this thing here is a quasi-local charge. So it is something that is written as an integral in space of some density that decays at least exponentially fast. So the second point is that um, equation one, I want to note that equation one is invariant under uh, the following uh, gauge transformation, if you want. So if I take the charge at order M and I add to that anything that commutes with a free Hamiltonian, then it's still, uh, the, the equation doesn't change, right? You see. Okay, so I will not add any term of this form in my construction. And the reason is that if I want to have a term uh, D that commutes with the free Hamiltonian and is built of more than two fermionic operators, this will not be local in space. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. What, what's the, uh, what thing are you trying to get in the end? I'm trying to, to get all the, the charges of the system. Why? You just want the effective velocity and then you've solved the problem, right? Yeah, that's true. But um, so my, my question is, um, how do I build this density of quasi-particles if I know, only know the fermionic operators? So you, you, you have the, this theory that I wrote before. Uh, and now you have to construct to write down the density of, quasi, of stable quasi-particles, right? This is not an easy task. You, you don't understand at the operatorial level what that is. So what, what I'm trying to do is I will write an operatorial form of all the charges. And I will use that to understand what the density of quasi-particles is when I write them in terms of uh, operators. That, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, any other questions on this? Uh, excuse me, my, my, maybe I'm go, go, go going too, too fast, but we hear the, his, how this density will be related to the quasi-particle density in the Beth and Zatz equations. Uh, yeah, I, I will try. I will try to to discuss this point. It, it's, a, it's of course a very good one, and uh, I, I will try to, to to discuss it in a bit. Um, okay. okay, I think it's better if we wait uh, a couple of slides and then maybe if I'm not uh, answering satisfactorily, uh, please, okay, please stop okay. me and ask again. All right. All right. So um, very good. Um, okay. So this is the strategy. Okay. It's very simple. Um, now, okay, let's start. So I, I, what I want to do is I want to take this uh, QF um, at order zero. I want to plug it into this equation and I want to find Q1 basically, okay? So let's do that. So if I just do this, I find the following expression. Um, so I find Q1, that is a four fermion term with this coefficient g of k1, k2, k3, 
that is non-singular. So what, this, what that means is that basically this charge will always be smooth. Uh, explicitly, let me just write down, okay. So G, G these, these coefficients G can be, can be written in this form. So let me uh, remind you that this F was an arbitrary function that I used to label a generic charge. Well, this V is the potential, right? Parameterizes the potential. So you see that essentially this uh, G4 coefficient has, has the same regularity properties as the potential. So for example, if you have a calogerous Sutherland potential that decays as one over X squared, this thing here will decay as a power law. But if you have a potential that decays fast, this will also decay very fast, right? It, 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 because it, it essentially it doesn't have divergences in, in momentum space. So it, it hits Fourier transform decays very fast. And what that means is that this uh, charge here that I, I'm constructing will be local enough in space, right? Will have the density that decays fast enough in space. And note once again that this essentially is true for any potential. Any potential that uh, is uh, local enough will produce this kind of, uh, of charge at first order. Here, I'm not seeing at all integrability. Here, all, all choices of potentials that are local enough will produce at first order a charge that is, that is local in space. Good. So instead, if I try to go, to go at uh, next order, so at second order, I will find that in general, um, the equation one admits quasi-local solutions only if I impose certain conditions on the potential. So now let me, uh, to, to, to be more explicit, let me just show what happens at, at second order. So what, what are these conditions? To, to show that, let me, consider, let me consider what happens at second order. So at second order, I find the following solution. So I will, I will find that the charge at second order has a four fermion part with some coefficient that is always uh, regular. And then I will have a six fermion part that has a coefficient that typically is singular. And in order for, the poten for, for this coefficient not to be singular, I have to impose the following condition on the potential, where A here denotes a complete anti-symmetrization with respect to this, uh, to this momenta that are written here, right? So this will be a sum of 36 terms here and, and with appropriately placed minus signs. And I have this condition on, on the potential. So this has to vanish whenever I have essentially these, these uh, set of Ks that are a solution of the momentum conservation, of energy conservation, but they are just, they are not a permutation of one another. So essentially uh, these uh, uh, six momenta are not uh, a solution of elastic, elastic scattering, if you like. Okay, so let me make two observations on that. The first observation is that one can show, it is uh, no, not obvious uh, a priori, but one can show that this condition here is exactly equivalent to requiring the vanishing of the inelastic component of the three particle S matrix at second order. Okay, right? So if I write down the inelastic component of the S, uh, uh, S matrix, uh, of the three particle S matrix at second order, I find this condition. And, and this is already something remarkable because I found this condition just basically imposing the locality of the charges, right? But the second observation is even more interesting. So we have the following theorem. So- Can I ask a quick question about this first yeah. observation? Yeah. This, um, in the normal S matrix theory, um, this is equivalent to this no particle production uh, is equivalent to having an infinite tower of conserved currents, which are local. So, um, but let me note a couple of things. So, first of all, here in this theory, you don't have particle production. You you cannot have particle production because you are conserving the number of particles. It's a non-relativistic uh, field theory, if you like. So, it, it, okay, but go ahead. But then this doesn't sound. What um, so your condition one is formulated in a different form, but it doesn't sound that different from what we already knew in QFT that um, 
integrability in terms of the S matrix factorizing into two to two S matrices is related to having an infinite number of conserved local charges. Yes. You yes. So factor. if if you want if you want this is an analogous statement made for these non-relativistic uh, field theories, if you like. And and once again, you only need uh, so this condition here. So what I'm talking about at the moment, it, it comes only from the second order charge and from the second order uh, uh, expansion of the um, three particle S matrix. But yes, uh, apart from that, it, it is a similar statement. Yes. Okay. Okay. But Which is a non trivial said, one. It is, it is a non trivial one. But you haven't um, said the three particle S matrix factorizes into two particle S matrices. You've just said that it's just, it's just not elastic. It's just, it's just elastic. It's, exactly. That's exactly. not a statement of integrability yet. In, I mean, in principle, this would not be completely equivalent. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. But let me come to the second observation and, um, and then we, we can um, discuss from there. So the second point is that there is the following theorem that holds. So the only potentials fulfilling condition one and admitting a power series expansion around zero are these ones. So these ones are basically uh, the Fourier transforms of, uh, of, of the virus trust function I, I wrote before. So essentially this exhausts all uh, integrable uh, cases I was listing at the beginning. So this solution here, if I find all the only solution, the only regular solutions to condition one are essentially integrable potentials. So this is covers all and only integrable instances of, of the theory with all the restrictions I, I was making at the, at the beginning of course. So, um, so is that statement true that the virus stress function always has a Fourier transform of that form? Yeah, yeah in, 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 in that limit, yes. Uh, because here ah, I'm taking okay. the thermodynamic limit. So yes, right. that, that's, okay. a, that's a very good point. Sorry? I mean, it does have two parameters, Ace. No, so you see, essentially, um, one of the parameters I set in the virus stress function was L. So I only end up with a, with a single one, with a single free parameter. So essentially, the most general thing I can do in, in, the, in the thermodynamic limit, essentially, after the dust uh, settles, is the one over sinh squared potential, essentially. And, uh, and that depends on a single parameter if you want. And that's, that's what I'm finding here. So this is the Fourier transform of the one over sinh squared potential. And then I recover the other cases. I recover the, the Bose gas or the, the, the fermionic formulation of the Bose gas as a limiting case of that. Um, so is your condition one somehow equivalent to the Calogero functional equation, which has exactly the same solution? Uh, that, so that's a good point. Uh, so a posteriori, if you want, yes, because it has the same solution, but no, no, I didn't find another way to show it. Uh, so I don't think so. Um, so, so this, I mean, to find this condition, essentially it, it is a very trivial way, way to do it. You construct imperturbation theory, the charges, and you impose them to be local, local in the sense I was describing before. And, and that uh, appears to be the same as uh, basically requiring the, the three particle scattering matrix to, to, to be elastic, uh, essentially, the, the three particle scattering to be elastic. And at the same time, it only gives solutions that are integrable uh, potentially. The, the functional equation that I mentioned is very robust in the sense that it arises imposing several criteria. One is the factorizability of the ground state wave function, the other is the uh, integrability of scattering, etc. So yes, it seems natural to me that it would arise also in this case. But I take your point that you have no direct way of uh, relating. Uh, I, I, think, I mean, uh, I'm not saying that is not possible. Uh, let, let me let me be clear. I'm just saying that I didn't succeed in doing it. Uh, this is very different. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, can I ask a question? In the analogous case, in the relativistic case, if you take the Lagrangian d phi squared plus v of phi, and then yes. demand that you have the first non-trivial higher spin conserved current, then you already get the condition that v of phi has to be an exponential. So you get uh, yes. 
Okay, so that would indicate that for the analogous thing you're doing here, condition one would be sufficient to fully fix the potential, but you somehow, oh, I guess that is what you're saying. You only need to condition Yeah, that's what one. I'm saying, yes. Oh, okay, this okay. Is what, that's essentially what I'm saying. Actually, one can be more refined here. So um, at the beginning, I was mentioning this um, um, regularized form of the potential for the Cheon Shigehara. So um, these potentials here, uh, if one wants actually to do any calculation, has to regularize them. And then what will happen is that the conditions at further orders will uh, basically give you a way, a well-defined way to regularize them. But if you just want the, the, the bare form of the, of, the integral, of the integrable potential, then that's, that's what is given to you by the second order already. So uh, th that's my, my understanding of that, of course. This is just an interpretation. I didn't prove uh, any of the things I just said. Um, <clears throat> any, any other question on, on this? So yeah, and so essentially, since these are uh, basically only integrable instances, we conjecture that all higher conditions are, are satisfied. So if we so satisfy condition one, then all the conditions that are coming from further orders, we uh, expect to be satisfied. But of course, uh, once again, we didn't, uh, we didn't prove that. This is a, a conjecture. All right. Um, okay, so going, going back now to the construction of the charges, then essentially the upshot is that um, I, I will construct um, a charge density that will have this form. So we'll have a quadratic, um, piece, then a quartic piece, a sextic piece, and so on. And these coefficients here will be all regular only when I look at integrable potentials. Um, while instead, if I truncate it at first order, it will always be regular. So the first order uh, charge here will be regular for any choice of the potential that is uh, well behaved in space. Of course, once I have these, I can also construct explicitly currents because I, I just use the, the, the continuity equation, essentially. So I say that the space derivative of the current is the commutator of the charge density with the Hamiltonian. So I can explicitly write, write down even this expression here. I can write down a very similar expression for the, for the charges. I, I don't do that because it's uh, lengthy, but this is possible to do. Very good. So essentially now I have a, in, in, in expression, well, an expression up to second order and then, uh, there will be other terms that uh, um, I, I don't compute explicitly for, for, for the charges. Okay, so now the second step of what I wanted to do before was to use these to construct a density of quasi-particles. So once again, um, any, any question on, on, this, uh, on this so far? Uh, any further question? No, okay. Okay, so we, we move on to the second step. So we, sorry. So we move on to the second step. So we achieved the first um, goal. Now we move to the second. So we build uh, these operatorial density of quasi-particles using the, the charges that we just constructed. So essentially the trick to build this operatorial density of quasi-particles is very simple. We essentially want to um, isolate the contribution uh, to a given charge of a single uh, free momentum mode. And the way to do that is, uh, well, to, to take a derivative with respect to this uh, generic function f. So if, if you want, you can either work in finite volume and then you take a real derivative with respect to f of some fixed momentum, or you want to work in infinite volume and then you take a functional derivative. But, but uh, let me be more, more well-defined and let me, let me just work in finite volume. So what I will do is I will take the derivative of, uh, so I will define my n of k and x as the derivative of, of my charge with respect to f of some given k, okay? So th this equation, this, uh, this um, n that I defined like that will uh, by definition fulfill the, the following equation here, right? So the sum over k of f of k, n of k will give me the charge. And that's just uh, essentially uh, coming from the fact that uh, charges are linear in this uh, function, in this generic function f. Okay, but then if I take this equation here, 
And if I consider the um, expectation value of these on a stationary state, and I take the thermodynamic limit, I end up considering something like that. So I will have some sort of integral of f, then the expectation value of n will be equal to, to a charge. So this is uh, intuitively pointing out to the fact that the expectation value of this n is nothing but the root density. Uh, I will uh, define this statement more precisely in a second, right? At this, in the same exact way, one can uh, define the operatorial current of these quasi-particles. So the idea is exactly the same. So one, one takes, defines this operatorial current as the derivative with respect to F of the current of a given uh, charge that is denoted by F once again. And if, if we do that, then basically we have that the operatorial density plus the operatorial current are fulfilling an exact continuity equation. This is just coming from the fact that charges were fulfilling a continuity equation. Okay, so once again, if we take the expectation value on a stationary state, we get an equation that is, uh, well, uh, takes exactly the same form as these uh, generalized hydrodynamics, uh, hydrodynamic equation I was talking about before. But let me just be slightly more explicit. So if I do that, uh, so if I construct my N uh, following the procedure I just described, I, I get something of this form. So once again, I will have a sum of uh, um, monomials um, in, in the fermionic operators involving two, two fermions, uh, four fermions, and so on and so forth. And uh, okay, so, and I can make uh, a number of, of comments on that. So first, in the integrable case, using perturbation theory, we can explicitly show, so this comes to the question of Alexei. So um, in the integral case using perturbation theory, one can actually show that the expectation value of uh, this n, so here I put a, at a generic order m, but actually what, 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 what we showed explicitly was at first order. At first order reproduces exactly the root density that one computes in beta ansatz. And where, so yeah. So where basically, uh, and then this is true for both the, 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 the density of particles and for the current, and uh, where, where you, con you compute the current using the, the standard formula I wrote before, when, where this uh, kernel K here is uh, known from integrability. Okay? So this was an, an attempt to answer this, the, the question of, of before. Um, uh, uh, just a moment, this N, N, D, depends on M, but uh, rho, rho is Sorry? just... Uh, yes. Uh, so, so what you N, do, what you do, it, it, N, let me be more... N, N average D, D, D depends on M. On, on M, you, you mean M here is the order in perturbation theory? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, the... Does it mean that you, if m goes to infinity, that uh, this n of k be, becomes the uh, d? Yes. Of density? Yes. So, my, at the least, this is what uh, I expect. I, I didn't verify that. I didn't. I, I computed it, for it, m equal. Probably m. this means that when m goes to infinity, that this n really b becomes the uh, conserved quant uh, the conserved quantity, right? So, so let, let me, yeah, so, um, yes. Okay, so if, if I can compute this N of K and X at every order in perturbation theory, then yes, I have a conserved quantity by definition, because I, I, that, that means it basically would mean that I constructed all the, all the charges of the system. Mm -hmm. the, then the second point is, um, what do I mean by, by this equality here? Well, th this is um, a non-trivial statement. So what, it, it is a bit technical, so maybe we can uh, discuss later. But the idea is that you fix a given beta state by fixing the occupation of the beta integers. And then you um, ex expand the root density in perturbation theory. In, in beta, right? 
So for a given distribution of better integers, the, distributions of, the distribution of better rapidities will depend on the interaction, right? So this is basically giving this rho as a function of beta. And what I'm, what I'm saying is that you can match this rho, at least the first order exactly, with the expectation value on that state specified by these uh, beta integers of this uh, function, uh, of these operators, sorry, n of k and x. Um, the, is this uh, clear? Yes. Okay, but maybe we, we can, if it's, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss that uh, further. This looks um, a bit like TBA. Uh, yes, it, it does. Okay. okay. So what I'm trying to say is that um, essentially these rows, you, you can compute from TBA. And my point is that if you compute the expectation value of this operator I'm giving you in perturbation theory, and you match with the result of TBA in perturbation theory, they agree at least explicitly at first order. The, uh, the expectation is that they will agree at any order. Right. Okay, so second point. The second point is try to um, match uh, the description of uh, generalized hydrodynamics with the description of uh, this BBGKY hierarchy I was mentioning before. But then now that we have this explicit expression, this is somehow uh, very clear. So what happens? Well, the expectation value of my N of K and X will play the role of the density of quasi-particles of my root density. And you see the root density is expressed as an infinite sum of uh, n particle density matrices for increasing n. So this is giving you a way to uh, pass from a description in terms of uh, BBGKY hierarchy to a description in terms of GHD. So uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that if you, uh, well, if you want to construct a quantity that has um, a no collisional um, Boltzmann equation as an evolution equation, which is the, the GHD equation, then you have to sum together all these uh, uh, n particle density matrices. So you're no longer assuming that the uh, four point function has no connected part? No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. So that, that, that one was essentially. Uh, just to, to, to write down the, the simplest possible truncation that you can have for the BBGKY hierarchy, but you yeah. don't need to do that. So yeah. here, I'm just saying that, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Do you encounter any divergences if you go beyond the, the simple Boltzmann equation when you start looking at higher order uh, densities? Um, Ultraviolet divergences? It's not. It's it's very hard to answer this question because I I don't write down explicitly these uh, uh, hierarchy equations. I just uh, um, am proposing a way uh, to organize these terms in, in in a way that actually their their the, the final equation that they will fulfill is is actually very simple. Is this a GHD equation that I wrote at the beginning? Um, so I'm just telling you. Uh, if you sum all of them with these particular weights um, and uh, with these particular coefficients, you will recover this density of conserved quasi-particles, and, and that will fulfill a very simple equation. But I, I, each separate term, I, I have no idea of what precisely this, um, well, the evolution equation of each one of these terms uh, separate. You're not equation. actually looking at the BBGKY equations. You're just you're just writing down the. Exactly, exactly. So I'm just trying, and essentially my point is that you can rewrite the density of conserved quasi-particles in terms of these n-particle density matrices that you use in the BBGKY. That's my, my, my old point. I, 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 yeah, I don't, don't want to study their evolution equation more uh, than that. Okay. Uh, Bruno, is, is another way to say the same thing, that the TBA equation basically contains scattering between arbitrary numbers of particles if you expand it as that Neumann series in the 
in the scattering phase, right? Because you have. Uh, yes, uh, I think, I mean, in a sense, uh, yes, um, I would say so. Okay. The, the, it essentially gives you um, an explicit way to see that, right? But yes. Um, yeah. Yes. So it's, it's, more, it's more of a sort of proof of principle, if you like. So you really, um, basically this tells you that at least if you uh, only work at very low orders in perturbation theory because then the calculations become too complicated but at low orders in perturbation theory you can actually understand how this uh, density of quasi particles is written in terms of the operators of the theory which is typically extremely hard right to do in integrability in general it's very hard to connect the the operatorial formulation of the theory with any any of the uh, quantities that you uh, work with in integrability Mm -hmm. So here, here you have a direct connection if you uh, work only at low orders in perturbation theory and so on. And, and maybe just a comment that classically, I think we can do this to all orders if you have a lax matrix. So it seems to me in that case, we do know how to write. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, and uh, so my final point, uh, I don't know how I'm doing with time, all right. So uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly mention the, the final point is that uh, I find remarkable that at first order in beta, instead N of X and T is uh, always uh, local. Essentially, you, you can use it to generate uh, conservation laws at first order in beta for any potential that is um, decaying fast enough in space. So. This uh, is relating to the phenomenon of pre-thermalization. Um, so what I mean by that is that, uh, so this is, this is basically telling you that there exists some time scale, uh, which I call T star of beta here, such that if I look at the evolution for times smaller than that time scale, the dynamics of my system, whatever it is, will look like an integrable one, right? So, and then I will start uh, noticing that I'm not integrable only later, only if I go beyond this scale. And now to understand how this scale, uh, this time scale scales with the perturbation strength, well, it, it is uh, a very difficult problem typically, but in many cases uh, has been shown that you can understand that just in terms of a, of a simple Fermi golden rule. So the time scale at which you will see actually when uh, you start to, to, to change the nature of your dynamics from, from an integrable light to something different, uh, will, will scale as the interaction, one over the interaction uh, strength squared. Uh, so you, you can show that for, for uh, simple systems, uh, for example, weakly interacting systems in the homogeneous setting typically, but uh, similar descriptions uh, have also been employed recently for um, interacting integrable models. Can you say, how, how do you see this, that for T less than T star, it looks almost integrable? Essentially, what I'm saying is that um, so, so from, from the findings I was describing before, what you are saying is that um, at first order in beta, you have essentially a, an infinite number of concert charges, whatever your potential is, as, uh, as long as it is uh, local enough. So this basically tells you that um, for times that are uh, shorter than at least one over G, uh, oh, sorry, one over beta, sorry, um, or, or, or one over your uh, interaction strength, uh, then you will behave essentially like uh, as if you were you, you were integrable. That 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 was my that was my point. So I, if you can construct conserved charges up to a certain order in perturbation theory, this means that, well, you, you, you can't be behaving very generically, at least for times that are uh, uh, compatible with that. And perhaps this is obvious. Why does um, first few orders in perturbation theory translate into early times? Or because you say that dimensionally, the time scale will be, uh, I, Will involve both beta and essentially, e. Essentially, the idea is you you will 
the way to understand it more formally is to consider scaling limits. So what you want to do is you want to send the interaction strength to zero and time to infinity, keeping a certain ratio. So the idea is that if since here you have conserved charges that are, are order beta, this is uh, suggesting, actually, you, you, in this case, you can actually do it almost explicitly, is suggesting that if, if you take the scaling limit um, T times beta fixed, and then you send uh, beta to zero, then you will end up with, uh, with uh, your, your system relaxing to a, to a generalized Gibbs ensemble that has as conserved charges these conserved charges that you, that you, you construct, essentially. So that, that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and then, yeah, okay, so the, this statement is, is, is a bit formal because it only holds in the scaling limit, but uh, of course, actually what, what, what happens is that, uh, well, if everything is uh, large or small enough, so if your interaction is small enough, then there will be some time window in which um, the, 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 the dynamics of your local observables will uh, approach very closely a, a plateau that is close to the, to the plateau of the, of the, of the, of the GGE. To these charges, essentially. And this use, this usage of the word prethermalization, it seems in literature to appear in two different contexts. It's also used to denote the Kolmogorov Zakharov cascade. Um, mm -hmm. You start with far from equilibrium initial conditions, and there's an intermediate time window in which there's a cascade of energy from long wavelength modes to short wavelength modes, which is approximated by a KZ spectrum. Mm -hmm. This sounds different than this usage of pre-thermalization. I don't know. And a different paper is cited for that. I don't know why they both have the same name. Yeah, that, that's, a, that, that's a good point. Um, yeah, th there is indeed some confusing usage of this term in, in, in the literature. So the one I'm trying to make here is that essentially, there is uh, some time window that depends on the perturbation strength uh, where over which the system behaves as, uh, as an integrable one. And then out of that, you will uh, drift to some um, uh, thermal generic behavior or generic thermal behavior. Um, yeah, so yes, I, I agree with you. There are many different uses of this term. Okay. Um, so that, that, that was it. So with, with that, I would like to just uh, briefly recall um, the, the content of the talk. So essentially what, what I presented to you was a perturbative construction of conserved charges in these uh, weakly interacting uh, fermionic gases. And uh, the main results are that, um, well, only for integral potentials, all charges are local at second order. This is a, 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 an exact statement. And the second one is that uh, we can construct this operatorial root density. So this operator that behaves um, as a, an operatorial form of, of the density of, of quasi particles in terms of monomials of the fermionic operators. So um, a possible, um, a, a number of possible future directions for that is uh, to extend the same treatment to systems that have bound states. And that is harder. This is more difficult uh, on the technical level. Um, and then other two directions is to use uh, this uh, operatorial form to, to uh, devise a systematic treatment of finite time corrections to the GHD equations. And, and the point is that here now we have an exact operatorial equation that we can study. So we can basically study the um, evolution from time zero um, if, we, if we want. And therefore we can find some um, uh, finite time corrections to these, uh, to these hydrodynamic equations. And, and the same idea is, uh, well, we, we can use this sort of operatorial formulation to devise some more systematic treatment of uh, integrability breaking. Because once again, now we have a well-defined operatorial form of, uh, of the root density. And so, we can use that to well uh, understand better what happens when you when you break integrability. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. 
Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, one more question. Uh, just to clarify, are you saying that pre this predicts that pre-thermalization happens after a time one over beta and then thermalization after a time one over beta squared? Is, is that the... Um, so, uh, all right, so the, the results I, I presented are compatible with the fact that if you take the scaling limit that is... Uh, uh, t times beta fixed, and then you send beta to zero, you will have a behavior that is uh, integrable like. And the reason is that you have at first order conserved charges. Now, um, what, what, what that means um, concerning the breaking of that? Well, it, you, you don't see it immediately from, from here. Yes, so it is true that at second order, you see that uh, this breaks. So this suggests that the transition happens uh, um, uh, as everyone expects. So at uh, time scales that are one over the perturbation strength squared. Um, but yeah, okay. So does it, once again, these are, these are um, simple uh, extrapolations of these results, but um, in order to actually understand better this time scale, one um, should probably um, write down some sort of uh, evolution equation that the operatorial root density fulfills. So in other words, you, you take uh, some small breaking of integrability, you write down what is the evolution equation for your root density operator, and then you take the expectation value and you see well, how that evolves. But the fact that you can't construct charges at order one over beta squared is suggesting that at that um, in that scaling scaling limit you will um, you will you will see the, the the drift away from integrability essentially. I don't okay. know if that. Yeah. That, okay. That the short answer to your to your question is yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I I was expecting to see at some point or at least to get a glimpse of how this relates to the exact known hydrodynamic description of the Calogero Sutherland type of uh, problems, the well-known one. And I must say, I, I didn't see any. So uh, could you give us an indication of how they would be related? Uh, so um, I would say that this one is a, a, is a very different setting. So, so you, you have in mind essentially the um, is nonlinear Lattinger liquid description. Right? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, so here the setting is, uh, is, is very different because um, we are not in any way at low temperatures here. So the point is that the, these kind of hydrodynamics that we are writing is for a state with arbitrary energy density. Right. And so the point here, is so this nonlinear Lattinger liquid is, is more powerful if you want because what it allows you to do is not only to find average uh, expectation values, but also to find fluctuations and uh, et cetera. And so you have yeah. some sort of hydrodynamics that is uh, formulated at the operatorial level. While here, instead, uh, we are less ambitious. So we are only looking at the evolution of expectation values. And uh, in this, for, for these quantities, we can study the same problem from, uh, let's say, uh, arbitrary um, initial states, not, not really arbitrary, but um, well, arbitrary energy densities. And so the, the, the relation is not so extremely direct. So what I can do is I can take the limits of my uh, equation and recover the, um, uh, <clears throat> the scalar hydrodynamics if I take the zero temperature limit, this I can do. But um, if I want to, to describe this, uh, well, okay, I think, I hope, uh, did, did I answer the, the question? I guess so, yes. I have a question. For item three, the systematic treatment of integrability breaking, what, um, what would you want to compute? So essentially my point is that, um, what is the problem of studying integrability breaking? Is that, um, well, one problem is that integrability gives you a number of very nice, uh, elegant objects that you have to, to treat your problem. But as soon as you break integrability, th th these objects are losing any meaning. For example, the density of uh, conserved quasi particles, if you break integrability, that is strictly speaking, doesn't exist. 
instead, with the construction that uh, we provided here, we, we, we give something that is uh, an operator. So this operator is well-defined, whatever you do. I mean, will we'll just be an operator that is always there. Now, in the integrable case, this operator has some special properties. In particular, it is local in, in space. And when instead you break integrability, this locality will, will, uh, will go away. But the operator is still there. So you can still use it to well, describe your system. For example, you can study the evolution of its expectation value or what it does when, when you put a very small breaking of integrability. So that, that, is, um, that was my point with this systematic treatment. But what, what um, let me rephrase the question. What would you, what can you calculate that would be of experimental interest? What can I calculate that would be of experimental interest? Um, Well, uh, already the expectation value of this um, operatorial root density is uh, somehow of, inter uh, of experimental interest. So because in experiments, they basically measure the density of these quasi-particles by essentially putting the system in a trap and then allowing it to expand freely. And then what you measure with the, with the picture is essentially, is essentially the density of quasi-particles. And so, um, well, Okay, so th this, this gives you, um, essentially will give you an equation for the evolution of rho when you break integrability, because now this rho will, has actually a meaning that is well-defined also beyond integrability because you have an operator. So rho is by definition, the expectation value of this operator. So you just write an equation for this operator, take the expectation value, that is an equation for rho. That, so that, that, was, uh, that was my point. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, any more questions? Okay, then uh, thank you again, and we'll resume in uh, 28 minutes with Patrick Dory. Thank you, thank you very much, and thanks for all the questions. <laughs>